I am very excited to present today's Burncast is Burncast number 10. Can you believe we have done 10? This is, we are the lucky 10 today. And in honor of that, I think that we should probably reintroduce ourselves because we don't do that very often. Um, I'll go first. I'm Cindy. I'm the Injury Prevention, Education, and Outreach Coordinator for Trauma and Burn Surgery here at Children's, and um, and I work in the same office with Liz Weibel. Liz, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then you, Anne? Sure. Thanks, Cindy. So I am the Trauma and Burn PI Coordinator, um, and I've been a Trauma and Burn NP with the service for 13 years now. Um, and I'm Ann Siriello. I am also a trauma, I'm a trauma and burn nurse practitioner, and I've been with the trauma and burn team for over four years. I've been at Children's, Children's National for about eight years now as a nurse practitioner. And a fun fact about Ann and I is that we go way back. We do. I used to be a PICU bedside nurse and mm -hmm. Ann was a nurse practitioner in the PICU. So we've worked together for a long time. Yes. And then if we go even further back, <laughs> when I started at Children's in 2008, I was on transport and I had to do trauma days and Liz Weibel was the teacher of that. So um, <laughs> it's all in the family. So in honor Small of- Small worlds. I know it is. It's sure. crazy. So yeah. It's a good really lesson is. for everybody. Don't burn your bridges. <laughs> really? No. Yeah. Because then you end up working with everybody later on. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. It's, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, burn. Ha ha. Um, so today um, we are going to do a review of less commonly or maybe more commonly used dressings. Mm -hmm. So we've our one of our first episodes, we talked about like all the different dressings and what to do with them. And it is pretty basic if you have a problem of like, what do you do with the dressing and all of that. And we've done extensive education on Aquaphor, Mepilex AG, um, Silvadine, mm -hmm. and I'm forgetting one. Oh, Bacitracin. Mm -hmm. um, zero form. Uh, zero form. That? That's the mm -hmm. one I was thinking of. Yeah. And I guess this is also a good disclaimer time of like, mm -hmm. we're not getting, um, we have no conflicts of interest and we are mm -hmm. merely, we are only discussing these dressings because this is what we use in our program. And um, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're getting, not getting paid for this. So, um, and this is just purely informational for our nurses specifically at Children's mm -hmm. National. Um, so Liz and, and so Liz, um, not only does she work for our trauma and burn surgery as our PI coordinator, but she also takes care of a lot of, um, our kiddos in the outpatient setting, um, at Friendship Heights and, and does inpatient and outpatient, um, burn and trauma stuff within our hospital. So they see kids, um, acutely and like throughout the whole process. And one of the dressings that I feel like I've seen a lot when we um, have our burn rounds. Oh, and let's talk about burn rounds. Liz, can you explain burn rounds? Absolutely. Oh, so burn rounds place. is a multidisciplinary weekly um, burn PI meeting. So basically it's uh, our burn attendings, especially the burn attending who um, is responsible for, for patients for the week is there our nurse practitioner team, our um, five East uh, educators, as well as nursing is there too. And then we have social work and case management and um, uh, PTOT. And so it's an awesome uh, multidisciplinary, as I said, um, weekly meeting where we discuss patients that are either admitted, patients that have been seen in clinic that have either psychological needs. Oh, Dr. Tully is there as well. Um, uh, patients that have, you know, unique needs or, you know, maybe the, we bring a patient to rounds to talk about which dressing to use, or there's a social situation to be addressed. So it really is, um, it really is neat. And then we'll also talk about patients, you know, we don't just, we continue to follow patients well into their recovery. I mean, months, sometimes even years. So um, at times, you know, if a family has a question or if we see a kid for annual follow-up um, and there's a concern or something we just want to um, share with the team, we will, that's the forum to do it as well. And we'll also, I just want to piggyback on that, that if a patient is in the ICU, we'll include the ICU team as well. So they're welcome to join mm -hmm. us for that if we have an ICU patient, which can be really helpful. Um, and then we've had some patients go to, um, rehab within mm -hmm. like our institution and we'll include those if if we have a patient there absolutely and um so burn rounds is um it's a great way to learn more about burns and it was at burn rounds where I started seeing um, a few different dressings that we haven't provided a whole lot of education to the staff about um and I thought that today would be a perfect day to run through um the 
previously less commonly used, currently now more commonly used dressings. And I feel like the one of the big ones is Acticoat. So tell me about Acticoat. And is it like one dressing? Do you use it with two? What's it made out of? What does it look like? Does it have a weird smell? You know, because like Xeriform has its own smell. Silvine has a smell. You know, they all have a thing. Yeah, so Acticoat, um, I think we often will say Acticoat. And what we really mean is Acticoat Flex. So Acticoat Flex is a product that is a silver impregnated product. And the way that we use it here at Children's National is that we apply it with a silicone-based product. So we apply it with a Mepitel. Um, we use Mepitel. There's two different, there's a couple, there's a few different types of Mepitel, but Mepitel is just silver only. Um, it has holes in it. So drainage can get through it. And the Mepitel that we use is slightly adhesive on both sides. So we take the Acticoat Flex, which either comes in a sheet or in a roll, and it looks brown because of the silver that's impregnated in it. We apply it to the an adhesive side of the Mepitel, and then the other side, which is also slightly adhesive, is applied to the burn. So the silver, so excuse me, the silicone is what touches the patient. Okay. And it allows for easier um, removal of the Acticoat, and we've found that it's just better tolerated, especially when patients are awake in clinic and doing um, bandage changes um, that aren't sedated in the operating room or something along those lines so it's burn skin mm -hmm. silicone mm -hmm. acticoat mm -hmm. cling sometimes there's a it? yeah a cling or a curl x or any sort of wrap we will because um unlike mepilex ag which we use frequently which has a foam and is a little bit more absorptive this is not an absorptive product it actually the drainage as drainage goes through it and it it um, you kind of need something on the other side to absorb that. So if it's your Curlex that's doing that, we sometimes use an eggs you dry or a Meplex pad or something like that to, to absorb the drainage on the other side of the bandage, or you just wrap it up in um, a bulky dressing with your cling or, or Curlex, depending on the part of the body that you're using it on. So what depth of burn do you use um, this Acticoat silicone um, sandwich with? Oh, that's a good way to call Sandwich. it. Sandwich. <laughs> um, I like to use personally when in my practice, I like to use Actico Flex on anything that um, is a partial thickness burn that's threatening to be a deep partial thickness burn. That I see any sort of signs that I feel like this is a little bit deeper than just kind of a superficial partial injury that will easily heal with Meplex AG um, because it's a bit stronger penetrating. Um, and I use it, we occasionally will use it on uh, either deep partial or full, even some full thickness burns if we need to bridge them to daily dressing changes or wherever they may be going next in terms of the treatment of the full thickness injury. So is that is about right, Liz, change? you think? I'm sorry, what would you, what'd you say, Cindy? You, you agree with that in terms of how we use it? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. I think, you know, we've always had in the back of our minds that if it's deeper than just a plain old superficial partial thickness, pink moist blanching that I think we've always had in the back of our minds that, you know, we, we, we opt for this product instead. And I think, uh, yeah, great explanation of um, using the X2 dry on top. Again, the deeper the injury, it can be more exudative. So nice to not have all that dried junk on the dressing when it <laughs> is stuck to the patient, you're trying to get it off in clinic. Um, but yeah. also, and it's, it's easier to wrap a hand in Acticoat, don't you think? Yeah, I, I do like it for hands because I think it, you know, it has kind of a flexibility and then it is a little bit adhesive. So I think it kind of for, bends with little fingers relatively well. Um, so how often do you have to change that dressing? Like, do you send it, kids home in it? Is it mm -hmm. only an inpatient thing? Um, like, do your parents change it? I, I just don't know. Usually Acticoat is, or Acticoat Flex is changed by our providers and it's something that we, it's a long acting bandage. So we put it on for three to seven days. Okay. Um, so you can use it in the hospital and you can use it outpatient because if it lasts I've for put it on days. in Yeah. I've put it on in the emergency department, clinic, the operating room, the PICU, the floor. I've, I've used it in every setting that I see burn patients. So um, can the Acticoat Flex touch the skin or do you put the Mepitel like in between it just to um, 
help it not get stuck to it? Like, why, why do you, do you have to do that? Or is that like a preference thing or? That's a preference. That's how we like to use it. I think if you talk to the manufacturers, the Acticoat Flex can go directly on the skin. We okay. find that it is better tolerated with the silicone product in between. And when you say better tolerated, like, I don't, what does that mean? Like, is it like, is it, painful? it's easier to remove. Okay. Yeah. I think it's easier to remove. Um, and I think it is less, yeah, I think it's less painful when you're taking it off. And I, I think that it works better with the silicone in between, which is kind of more so from Anne's journal of anecdotal medicine and not necessarily mm -hmm. that there are any like RCTs or randomized controlled trials about this, but I find that I think it, the, I, I don't know exactly why, but I think that the burn heals better with the silicone in between, or maybe it just doesn't peel off as much of a scab or kind of peel off the new fragile skin. I don't, you know, this is kind of a little bit more of a gestalt thing, but that's how we do tend to use it. I think if the, if you didn't have that bilayer, again, it's so crucial to kind of, again, leave that healing skin behind. You're going to have just a really dried mess on your hands. It's almost like an overlying yeah. scab on the flex. And then you pull it off. There's going to be a lot of secondary trauma and bleeding. So yeah, I think yeah. Is this kind of like a replacement for like a drip method where, um, you know how, cause I, um, when we went to ABA, I like watched, I, or I didn't watch, I like participated in a couple of different lectures where I was listening, not just watching, I was using my listening ears. And they were talking about the, like, um, a lot of like in adults, they do like a drip method where it's like this constant infusion of like something to make sure that the burn didn't dry out in hospital. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering like, is the is the um, Mepotel kind of like that, but just like a long-term thing? Because I can't imagine doing a drip method with a kid, especially mm -hmm. out, outside of the hospital. Is Or am I completely like off base of like hearing about that and then putting, the, putting those thoughts together? I think that the Mepotel provides a layer that is less likely to adhere to the burn. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I'm saying that it's like a little <laughs> adhesive on it, I know that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But I think that um, the Acticoat Flex is a is a dry is a very dry product, and it doesn't have mm -hmm. it's a fine, almost like a very 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 fine mesh in a way. Um, it's kind of how you can think of it. I don't have one in my hands, which probably would have been a good idea for the video aspect of this. But um, it's meant to have kind of fluid drain through it. Um, I think the silicone product and it if that gets really wet, it can sometimes, the flex actually like kind of stick and dry almost mm. into a scab like um, fashion. And so if you pull that off, you can kind of pull off some of the, the skin underneath of it is my kind of assessment of how this goes and that the, the silicone layer really helps uh, prevent that and, and comes off a little bit easier, especially as all of this can dry, because if we use it in partial thickness injuries, as they heal, they dry. Um, but then you're, you're kind of taking this dried bandage off of dry skin. And sometimes that can be challenging to get it to remove without pulling off either the recently epithelialized skin or, um, scabs or something along those lines. Okay. I like the way that the Mepilex is a little sticky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and wounds need a little bit of moisture to heal too. They can't mm -hmm. just be like, to like totally, totally dry. You know, think about like a skin knee, you know, needs a little bit of an ointment and then a bandage for covering. So. Well, and I think that that's like one of like the, like the main tenets of like, um, any type of like burn or wound healing is don't let it dry. Mm -hmm. Like don't let everything get dry, especially like in the beginning stages. Mm -hmm. Many people say that they think that they need to let it air out, but we don't feel that way. We like to have our bandages in place so we can use our, our treatments on the burn injury instead of letting them air out and dry. And then you kind of get a layer of scab that it's harder to penetrate through with our, with our bandages. New, new skin can't grow through a scab and that's the whole <laughs> purpose, right? We just want the new skin to grow. Mm -hmm. So does Acticoat, is it perforated or is it like a solid sheet? <clears throat> Are there like holes through it or not, um... not very visible holes? It's almost like, um, it's almost like a piece of fabric. Okay. 
where you would say or like a cheesecloth yeah. but it's like okay. in between like a, a cotton and a cheesecloth like it's you wouldn't see holes necessarily but if you held it up to the light you may feel like you could like it's it's a very finely woven you know thinking about like sheets thread count or something I'm sure you could do the thread count of it but okay. it's um or you know I'm trying to get to it but and it does it like flexes like a piece of mm -hmm. fabric like it okay. it comes in a roll or a sheet and if you drop it down it it kind of falls into like a, a little ball or whatever because it's more like a piece of fabric okay Acticoat um, makes another product that's just Acticoat, and that one looks more like a piece of tin foil, yeah. which is the best way that I can describe it. And it is not, and when you hold it up, like if I were to hold it up, this is, sorry, what I have. If I were to hold it up, man, the background's not helping. That's if okay. I were to hold up a piece of Acticoat, it would be like a sheet. But if I hold up a piece of Acticoat Flex, it's kind of more like this. You know, oh, so like fabric versus yeah. paper. Yeah, fabric, fabric versus fabric paper. Versus foil. <laughs> foil. Fabric versus yeah. foil. Okay, okay. Um, does it? Um, does Acticoat Flex have a smell? No. Mm -mm. When the drainage comes out, does um? So for all of the burn dressings that we've talked about in the past, mm -hmm. whenever there's drainage, there's always a smell. Yes. Is there a different smell so, of Acticoat Flex or is there like, what's a good smell versus a bad smell, good color versus bad color? Like, what do people like, cause we just went into like a very long, like explanation of like what Acticoat Flex is and when we use it. But now to get to like the nitty gritty of like, if you see a patient with this on it, like what do you, what, what's normal and what's not normal? So it needs to stay on as Ann said for like, three, five, seven days. So the kid's not taking a bath. It, this dressing is staying in place. And so we tell parents that it the kids are probably going to smell like a sweaty sock, right? Because kids are still going to run around, hopefully, and sweat and again, not get baths. So that's not necessarily a bad smell. So I, I can, again, kind of, they smell like sweat <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay to smell like sweat. Okay. Um, we, and then some normal drainage. Um, if you imagine again, um, you know, silver, when silver tarnishes, it's kind of produces like a grayish brown color. So sometimes you'll see that what we call strike through. So it's fluid that's tinted by the silver, um, on the outside right. of the dressing is kind of takes on like a brownish. It's not dirty. Thing. It's just not dirty. Silver. It's just okay. yeah, silver. I think it's that's fluid very that's gone through the silver. And so it's kind of, again, this tarnished appearance. Um, so that's, what's normal. Abnormal would be like a grossly purulent appearing wounds. So yellow, green, malodorous, smells, like really yeah, malodorous. Like, yeah. So there's um, like, normal stinky sweat and right. then there's like something's not right here right right and also the, the, degree to know the, difference. Of, the degree of exudate like okay to again as we say have some strike through so some drainage on the dressing you don't want to be able to wring it out though right you okay. that's bad so those are those are the things to look out for malodor um drainage that's not kind of a, a grayish brown color um and then excessive drainage meaning that it's a, it's a deeper injury or potentially infected and I would say that generally when we're using Acticoat, it's such a thin layer. So between even with the Acticoat and Mepitel and we're bulking things up on top of it, you may, we, you definitely can see strike through, but it's going to be hard for you to see like the burn itself, unless you're changing the bandage or it's kind of slipping around or something along those lines. So you may most know that there's an infection or concern with fever or the smell you may see most, but generally when I have patients um, and I'm applying Acticoat in clinic, one of my kind of pieces of education that I, my pearls that I give to parents is you will see drainage come through and it will be brown. And that's from my bandage. That's not from your, your, your child's like burn that that's kind of the strike through coming through the bandage. So don't be alarmed by that, which I think is very important. Yeah. And very helpful because as a parent who didn't have, who, who, his, whose child has never had a burn injury and now they have a dressing on, and then you see brown stuff coming through yeah. the dressing. I'm sure that would be extremely distressing yes. for a family member or for a bedside nurse who hadn't used seen mm -hmm. Acticoat before. I'll tell you what, if yep. I had brown on my dressing, um, my instant thought would be that it was stool from somewhere. I'd be like, we need to change this. But, um, 
that is not always the case, especially if it's like, mm -hmm. you know, far away from the source. So there you go. Um, okay. Anything about um, Acticote Flex that we haven't talked about that you think would be really important for our nurses to know, or um, if a surgical resident's watching this or like a, um, like a community ER physician, anything that you think is important? Logistically, we stock it on the fifth floor and it's not stocked in the, our emergency department. Um, I think it's in our operating room as well, but it's not, it's not something that you will easily find um, unless you you know where to look for it almost. Uh, so I think that's important to know if you are having issues with it. You can, I'm sure you could find it, but you can always call the Burton team and we can assist with that and kind of figure out usually the dressing changes with Acticote are done by our team. Is Acticote Flex used for anything else other than burns? I mean, I think you, we I imagine use so. it for, but you could use it. I get in yeah. theory, you could probably use it for any type of wound coverage. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering. I was like, hmm, I wonder if they use it for anything else in the hospital. I don't know. At it's our possible. hospital, I don't know. Yeah. We could, that would be a question for the wound team. Yeah. I'll ask them. Maybe they use it for pressure ulcers. Okay. Well, anyway, um, another thing that I've heard. So one of the things that I've heard in burn rounds said a lot is triple cream. Now, when you say triple cream in the PICU, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that means that we got a really bad diaper rash going on. I'm assuming- You know what's in triple cream in the PICU? I was wondering if, is it the same thing that you I, put on burns? I think the triple cream in the PICU is desitin, which is a zinc-based product and nice yep. statin. Mm -hmm. Yep. And cholesteramine. Yep. And yes. cholesteramine binds with the bile and helps like remove, because usually it's in a setting where a patient is having a lot of loose liquid stools and you've yeah. got a really bad diaper rash. So the nystatin is to treat anything fungal. The cholesteramine is to kind of like draw the, the loose liquid stools away from the buttocks and the zinc is, or desitin or whatever product is to kind of coat the skin yeah. and protect the skin. Um, yeah, that's, that's not our triple cream. Yeah. I didn't think it was, but it's yeah. funny because everybody, like if you're in the picky and you hear triple cream, you don't think burns, yeah. you think butts, which is mm -hmm. probably not the way to say it, but you think like diaper rash. Yeah. So yeah, tell me about triple cream in burns. What is it? What would you use it for? And, um, yeah. So in burns, it is a mixture of hydrocortisone, and uh, mupiracin, uh, which is also, which is Bactroban, um, and Nystatin, either cream or powder. Although I think the preference is to use the powder, right, Anne? I um, like the powder because it kind of pastes it up a little bit. So this, you can use it when burns take a while to heal. We usually use three weeks as our threshold. When it takes more- So than these three, are like outpatient kids. Yeah, these yeah. You're really not, not going to see doing much of it unless you have an admitted burn patient who's been in the hospital for, you know, for many weeks and burns right. have mostly healed, but maybe you still see some open areas. So we usually mm -hmm. are using it for patients who have prolonged wound healing um, plus minus infection. But what you see at that point is you may have some satellite areas in the burn that are still open um, with bright pink tissue. We call that hypergranulation tissue. It's just the body's response when there's a deeper injury to try to heal itself. And then by doing that, it produces this friable, so like really fragile pink tissue um, that's moist and we just need to, you know, be done with it. We want wound coverage. We want these things to be scabbed over. So it's an effective way to dry out that hypergranulation tissue. So it's like the antithesis of early burn wound care. It's like, this needs to heal. This is the time where we want it to get dry. Right. Yeah. So the hypergranulating tissue is like kind of beefy and, and sometimes like looks larger and inflamed or and it's the steroid, it's the hydrocortisone that um, kind of helps dry it out. Does and it we help use with the, itching too? Does a triple cream um, help the kids itchy with all the hypergranulation tissue? Usually the itching is from either dried skin or, or a hypertrophic scar. Um, so that's not necessarily the same type of treatment. Usually, and a lot of times when our patients are itching, I'm going on a tangent here, but I'm semi answering your question. <laughs> um, a lot of times when our patients are itching, it's because they've been in a bandage like Acticote or Mephilex for three to seven days. And they have some epithelialized dried healed skin, which means that it's healed and it's, and 
the bandage has been in place for a while and it's almost like you have like a dried spot you can't get to and it hasn't been moisturized in a while. So that's usually where we get our like short-term itching from. Um, and you can also get long-term itching from thick kind of hypertrophic or keloid type scars. So the cortisone is more to help with like the mm-hmm. ballooning of the tissue, not for any itching. Cause I think that right. a lot of time when you hear cortisone, mm-hmm. you think, yes, bug bites and yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. Like eczema or, you know, something like that. Yeah. But we're using it to really just kind of settle it down and it wouldn't be over the whole burn. We would just use it over mm-hmm. those residual open areas. And so, um, as do you cover that or do you just put the paste on? Do you- um, I, I would advise that it's covered just so it doesn't ruin any clothing. And so it actually yeah. stays on. So under a bandage or, you know, mm-hmm. nonstick pad or something like that, but usually mm-hmm. these are like much smaller areas. The majority of the burn has healed, but there, you know, are just still some residual open areas. So do you, make it or do you order it? Do you, or do you order triple cream or like, so again, like in the pick you, if you mm-hmm. are doing like the, the diaper rash stuff, you kind of like get all the ingredients and then you're kind of like mm, and mixing it mm-hmm. up, but for the triple cream, do you just order it or do you make it? We order the three components okay. and then we advise to mix it immediately before applying to the, to the burn injury. So I will actually take whatever I'm applying it on in terms of the, the exterior bandage. So either a nonstick gauze or, um, a regular gauze, what kind of whatever I'm choosing to use because of the location of the body and the size of the area that's open. And I will just like kind of squirt roughly art, not science, equal parts of the two ointments and like sprinkle of powder and then mix it together on my like telfa or bandage and then put that on the patient. That's how I do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Liz, do you, is that, the, is that how you do it too? Um, I don't use as much of it. Um, so, and so I, you know, I, I've just, prescri- you have to prescribe the three different components. So I guess mm-hmm. that's an important teaching point for, you know, the family, if they have a prescription for mm-hmm. it, it's like you're it's not just one prescription, it's three different. So mm-hmm. that sounds like a good strategy. So when you're, um, when you're talking about like hypergranulation tissue, what is the other um, thing that you put on hypergranulation tissue that's not triple cream? I can think of two other treatments that we use yeah. for it. One is called gentian violet. Yeah. And it's a, um, it, is used it's this bottle of basically purple liquid which will absolutely stain if you spill it on something say like your watch band or the (laughs) operating room floor I don't know I mean those are just a few examples that come off the top of my head if I were to like make some up but um it certainly can stain and you apply that to the areas of uh hypergranulating tissue as well how do you put it on that does it stain the skin Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I either apply it with a Q-tip, a gauze, or a syringe, depending on how big the area is and where how I'm trying to get it. Just paint it until it turns purple. It turns purple. Okay, and is it? It's it's a liquid. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So the bottle, would you say, like two inches, two inches tall? It's a little <laughs> bottle, right? The bottle's probably thirty mLs. Yeah. Okay, and so. Right? Yeah, you just big. drip some on and paint it onto the hypergranulated tissue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if it gets onto tissue that isn't hypergranulated, what happens? Just stains it purple and it comes off a few days later. Okay, so it's not stained forever. Mm-mm. Right. Not on the skin. Okay. Maybe on your watch band or the mm-hmm. operating room floor, floor. potentially, <laughs> but skin, it goes not on your skin. Yeah. And um, does it hurt? Like, does it burn or anything? I have not had patients tell me that it burns. I have had some patients be a little bit sensitive because um, this is like an open area. They don't want you touching, right? But not that this specific treatment burns. Mm -mm. Is there any place you wouldn't use gentian violet? Face. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I probably wouldn't use it on the face. Um, (laughs) I wouldn't use it unless we have hypergranulating tissue. Like I wouldn't just put it on a three-day-old burn. Okay. So hypergranulation tissue. So that's just another way to combat it is this, Mm -hmm. um, the gentian violet. Do you ever use it? Like what makes you think gentian violet instead of triple cream or triple cream instead Mm -hmm. of gentian violet? I think triple cream. So we often try and uh, limit our triple cream use to 
five days because of the steroid component. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll do like another five day course, but I think triple cream is when you're seeing some like really like hypergranulating tissue and you're like, we got to knock this down and you're still doing daily treatments. One place where I really like gentian violet personally is on a patient who has a large TBSA burn and is pretty far out and they just have some scattered open areas. And what I'm trying to do with the gentian violet is like dry up some of the areas so that I can, I can leave their extremity or whatever area open, because you may find that a patient has, you know, has 10% TBSA burns to an extremity and most of it's epithelialized or healed or scarred or whatever it is. And then you have these like small spots that are spread out. And I really have to wrap their whole arm for like four small spots. And I find that gentian violet is a really good spot where you can kind of get something to dry up and almost look like a scab. Um, and then you don't have to have a bandage on it. It's a little bit less sensitive. So I, that's where I really like it. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of gets patients out of daily dressing mm -hmm. sometimes when they just have some small scattered areas. How do you send it home with families? You can get it. You can get it over the counter. You can order it on Amazon. Um, but you can do buy you it have families counter. like apply it. So say you put it on a kid in three places in clinic and yes. then send them home. Like, do you have the parents like do I it? Think it or? I think it depends on the degree. If you have like a teeny tiny area, I would paint it on and I'd say, Hey, just protect it with a little bit of zero form. Um, and this should do the trick. If it opens up again, get some over the counter and dab it again, get, you know, dab it yourself on yourself at home and do it every other day. Again, it just depends on how big it is. Sometimes just one application in clinic with some zero form at home can do the trick. But if it's a wound that we're treating and we're like six, eight weeks out, then oftentimes the family will have to get some over the counter and just, you know, mm -hmm. apply it every other day with, you know, zero form for protection or, you know, as needed. Um, if a kid puts it in their mouth, is do they need to call poison control? Because if you're sending it Actually, at home or <laughs> it is used for thrush. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. no, I don't think so, but mm -hmm. I'd look at the bottle, but yeah. Cause I know we talk a lot about like one of our um, things that we clean burns with is Vosh. Mm -hmm. And um, even though it smells like chlorine, if it gets in a kid's eyes or nose or mouth, like it, mm -hmm. it's like, it's fine. Right. I mean, nobody's going to drink a bottle of it, obviously, but mm -hmm. I always wonder like what happens if a kid gets gentian violet in their mouth? So I didn't know that they used it for thrush. Purple mm -hmm. 10. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I don't think it's, I think Nystatin is a lot better used for thrush, but I think right. it was, uh, it's kind of more like a, in the past, it was used for thrush. Obviously, nobody should be drinking it. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, yeah, I was just wondering if kids have it at home. I mean, if somebody drinks a bottle of gentian violet, you should probably call poison control. Yeah. Right. So that's fair. 888 <laughs> I think is what the number is or something. 1 800 222 It's a mystery. Yep. That's it. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, if a kid got it in their mouth, because if it's not supposed to be on the face, I worry about it, like, getting in the mouth and then, you know, stuff like that. So you said that there was two uh, two things. One mm -hmm. of them was gentian violet. What's the other thing that you use for hypergranulation tissue? Well, sometimes we'll use silver nitrate, mm -hmm. which um, it, you, we usually do in the operating room uh, just because it can be a little bit painful, especially if you're getting on it on the surrounded skin, but that's another treatment for hypergranulating tissue. So tell us what silver nitrate does because it's intense. <laughs> it basically sounds like burns. you have experience with it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it burns the hypergran tissue to kind of get it to scab over. How so do you explain that? Oh, well, it, well, I guess the Andy chemical just said that you do it in the yeah. OR. Yeah. So. yeah. Chemical pottery. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Um, on, and this is not a burn patient, but they, it's used a lot around G-tube sites when patients mm -hmm. have truly hypergranulating tissue and that tissue, um, has, doesn't have nerve endings in it. So if you protect the tissue around it really well, you can, and, um, on the umbilicus of newborns, mm -hmm. they'll sometimes mm -hmm. use it. Um, so if you protect the surrounding tissue, it's not painful to the hypergranulating tissue. Um, but in our burn setting, it sometimes can be hard to say like, this is definitely hypergranulating and has no sensation versus like it's sensitive. So. Oh, that's a, I forgot, I totally forgot about silver, silver nitrate. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. um, I, it was ordered for one of my patients in the PICU and it came, um, at the, the bedside and I, I'm looking at this and I'm reading the order and I was like, you want me to do what with what? 
And yeah. it's like warning. There's like 82 yeah. different warnings on mm-hmm. the um on the because it comes in like a tube. Uh-huh. Like yep. a it's like a big thing of matchsticks. Yeah. Match yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um yeah, it's like, I don't know, like eight, not eight, ten inches long, and it comes in a yep. little tube, and then you open mm-hmm. it up and you take out the stick, and then you really I was like, Do you like you just put it on there? And I was like, Oh yeah, that's exactly what you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm glad that um, we most of the time do that in the OR because I feel like that would be a hard thing to explain, like at like in a clinic appointment, mm-hmm. um, or even even at the bedside. It's definitely an impressive thing to like try to explain chemical cautery to anyone. Um, well, wow, we we've been going for about a half an hour, and really, I have, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know. Should we? Should we go, should we talk about one more thing or should we sure. wrap up? Yeah. How do we up feel? Up to you. You're, you're the boss, whatever you oh. think. Let's talk about collagenase. Okay. Because I really know nothing about collagenase. Mm-hmm. So collagenase is I just an enzymatic, it it's, um, it's an enzymatic debrider. It's uh, the generic is, no, the generic is collagenase and the brand is Santal. So you may have it S A N T Y L. It may be um, called either one of those. And so basically, it works on um, deep partial or full thickness burn injuries where you have either eschar or pseudo eschar, and you're trying to get something like Miss Pac Man to eat at the overlaying eschar or pseudo eschar that's how i think like of it sylvanine. it's like an enzyme like yeah. it's, it's it like works sylvanine. similar to mm-hmm. yeah yep yeah is it the same it's color a, no it's clear okay it's like a clear mm-hmm. ointment it looks a little bit like um like a really like a thick vaseline almost like a vaseline coming out of a tube and um do you put it on the same way you put on sylvanine you so when what, collagenase does not have any antimicrobial properties, silvadine mm-hmm. does. So silvadine can go on a burn by itself. Collagenase we often use with something that has some sort of am, antimicrobial coverage. Um, the options for that are usually uh, Mepilex AG. So what you do is you apply the collagenase to the burn. You put a Mepilex AG pad over it, and then you remove the Mepilex AG pad. And you can actually save the Mepilex AG pad and use it for a few days. You wash the patient and their burn, and then you apply more collagenase after you dry it off and get them out of like cleaning the burn injury. So you apply it every day, but you re- can reapply the same Mepilex AG pad for a few days. Occasionally, if I have a burn um, where most of the burn needs something like a zero form, I'll put it on zero form because that has bismuth in it. And then I'll put the collagenase on like the deeper area that just needs to be cleaned up a little bit more. And why would you choose collagenase over silvadine? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I think it has more dressings because yeah, you're and using that and Mepilex. With Sylvadine, you're just using Sylvadine. Yep. Um, when something is truly looks like Escar and I don't see anything pink and I don't see something that looks like it's close to bleeding or bleeding, I find that it's a really appropriate use for Sylvadine. So like it's a, it's um collagenase is a little bit more gentle and I use it in instances Mm. where there's a little bit of something that needs to get cleaned up, but it's also, there's some nearby very friable tissue that I don't, I think Sylvanine is too powerful for. Okay. So just like the Acticote Flex is a little bit for burns that might look like they're getting worse. The collagenase are is for like bad burns that might not be as bad. So it's like kind of like both of those are like the in betweeny mm-hmm. stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you might have yeah. gone through like a, a course of sylvadine and we've cleaned up a lot, but kind of it's time to transition to collagenase um, and let it gently clean up the rest of it without like sylvadine on a burn that doesn't need sylvadine can kind of make it like bleeding or hypergranulating and collagenase is a little bit more um, gentle when it comes to that. Um, And collagenase is also extremely expensive and not readily available at local pharmacies. So we can get it, um, but it's more challenging to get. So that also can kind of impact your decision. Also silver or collagenase we'll use a lot of times on faces and Mm -hmm. like ears and scalps. 
where in areas that were less likely to use silvidine. Oh, okay, that's a that's a good point because we don't uh, typically use silvidine on the face mm-hmm. and or the ears. So for the ears, so the ears and the scalp and the face, you can use collagenase. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. All right. What, Liz, what do you have to say about collagenase? Historically, we would actually use it more for traumatic wounds, um, uh, road rash, like bad road rash or like, you know, deep puncture wounds, things like that. But, um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing it used more and more in partial thickness injury these days. And I think as Anne uh, suggested, you know, the overuse of silvidine can have detrimental effects too, right? So if you use too much of it, or if you use it for too much, too prolonged a period of time, then you have the whole hypergranulation tissue problem. So, mm. um, so that's why, you know, we keep bringing patients back or we'll check in with photos or telemedicine, just again, to make sure that we're not over-treating, that we're appropriately kind of downgrading treatment um, throughout the course. Okay. Okay, so today we have talked about, well, we started talking about Acticote Flex and how you um, put the Mepitel in between. So you make the little sandwich and those are for um, partial thickness burns that are deeper. So not the superficial partial thickness, it's the deep partial thickness where you're starting to get a little bit more worried. Then we talked about hypergranulation tissue. Now, this is something that happens, like you said, like three to four weeks after the burn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then those three options were silver nitrate, which is the chemical cautery, Mm -hmm. um, gentian violet, which is that fun purple stuff that stains OR floors and watch bands. Mm -hmm. And then um, triple cream, which is not the stuff that they use in the PICU for diaper rash. This is the stuff that had cortisone, Mupirison. My statin. My statin. My statin and mupirison. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then finally we talked about the um collagenase, which mm-hmm. is like silvadine, but not as strong and can be used on the face. I love collagenase. I wish wish it were more readily available and cheaper. Just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if, if I've I could, ever I would seen use it. it a lot more than I do, actually. Mm-hmm. I think I I I I do like it and it's challenging to get and sometimes really expensive. And so it's like, you're not going to use it on a teeny little area, but sometimes we do. And I really liked how you explained it's like Miss Pac-Man eating away all of the stuff. Every time I put it on and I'm like, it's an enzymatic debrider. It's like eating at the little piece. Like I'm like, you know, I kind of just think it reminds me of Miss Pac-Man eating away at that. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, okay. So, you know, it's about that time. Mm-hmm. My favorite part of Burncast of like, if you had one thing that you want people to walk away with, and I'll go first, that I think that, um, that we have to remember that not one patient mm-hmm. is the exact same as another patient mm-hmm. and the, um, burn dressings are definitely an art and it comes with a lot of experience and knowing what works and knowing what doesn't. And um, sometimes you have to change the course of treatment based off of how the patient's doing with that. And, you know, there's so many things that factor in. So like us as nurses need to remember that just because we did it one way with one kid doesn't mean we're going to do it the same Mm -hmm. way with the next kid, because each kid is different. Each burn is different. Like the temperature of how they got burned is different. The mechanism is different. So I think that um, we should all have like a, a really good like understanding that it's an understanding that we might not have the best understanding of what's being done, but always to ask a question and um, that our nurse practitioners are awesome and um, we'll be able to explain that to us. All right, Liz, that was me. I was long. Okay. Oh, I liked that. That was a good one though. I liked it. I know. That's why I went first. I liked how you described it as an I totally was, was gone. kind of going that way. I would make sure for admitted patients that you use the videos, have the families watch the videos. Mm -hmm. There can be so many nuances to care, right? Some of these dressings stay on three to seven days or up to three, three to seven days. Some dressings are daily, some are twice a day, like, you know, facial care. So have families watch the after the burn videos. um, And when they're being discharged as well, make sure they have all the videos they need for everything they they need before they come and transition to the outpatient world, like the burn clinic video, et cetera. So watch the videos. (laughs) <laughs> and Anne close us out okay wait it's my 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 biggest tip from today I mean obviously I'm just killing time because I've done this 10 times now so I know what, what you're asking let me think <laughs> um I really liked Cindy's 
I think my biggest take home from today is that there's a lot of weird things that we do. And sometimes Liz and I will look at the same burn and do mm-hmm. things differently. And that um, I'm always happy to discuss what bandages are. And I don't think it's ever like a stupid question to ask, to say, what is this for? Why are you putting it on this part of the burn versus not that? Um, and just reach out to our team because we use a lot of different treatments and some of them you've heard of, and some of them are kind of funky, like the ones we've talked about today. Um, but so we've come to like some of them or are using more of them um, more frequently. So I say, just please be open to us and ask us questions because I'm always happy to talk about burns. All right. Well, and happy 10th pod. I know. Happy 10th podcast. Happy 10th burncast. Burn I know we should have sang happy birthday to the cast. <laughs>